Good afternoon or good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is Barry Norman on behalf of Investing.com, and welcome to our quick look around of what we can expect in the Forex markets in the coming year or the new year that just started, 2017. So let's take a quick look and start off with the most common currency of all, the U.S. dollar. So we don't have time to look at all the currencies, commodities, stocks, and indices for the year. So we're going to start off with the U.S. dollar, and we'll take a look at the Fed, and we'll take it from there. But then we'll try to figure, focus overall on the Forex market, and we'll take a look, a real quick look at what we expect gold and oil in the coming year also, since a lot of Forex platforms offer gold and oil. Now, heading into 2017, as we are here, and tomorrow will be actually the first full trading day, U.S. dollar bulls have much to be joyous about. The Federal Reserve plans to embark on a gradual mission of tightening policy further from current levels. So remember, last month, the Federal Reserve raised interest rates by a quarter of a point, 25 basis points, but they also changed their projection for 2017, estimating three increases this coming year as opposed to two. Now, we have seen inflation moving to its highest point in years, and the labor market's a little bit slacker than it was, but it's still very, very good in the United States. Moreover, the proposed physical stimulus in the form of spending and tax cuts are all still on the table despite some doubts. You know, we have Donald Trump coming in office, and this is going to have a big effect on the dollar and a big effect on trade throughout the world and could have an effect, it's going to have an effect on all the dollar crosses. Now, all told, the U.S. remains the least dirty shirt of the most advanced ec economies heading into the new year. We're the only one that's really on a sure footing. However, even though there's much cause for optimism, many analysts remain skeptical about the U.S. dollar's potential. This being just a dollar hit uh, right after the Fed increased rates, hit 103, which is a very, very, very high level for the dollar. So it may be the dollar stays strong, but it doesn't have that much farther that it could possibly move. Just like the stock market hitting 20,000, it doesn't have much farther to go after that. So even though it's strong and positive, how much more gains will we see? Now, the global backdrop, for one, is more precarious than ever, especially with the looming geopo geopolitical risks across Europe and North America, growing pains of demonetization in India, and decelerating Chinese economic activity. Okay. Now, China did release uh, yesterday, or this morning, actually, some very good economics, and in China seems to be fairly turning around. But, you know, China's exports are really, and manufacturing, has a big effect or is very closely tied to the U.S. The U.S. economy is doing well since they're the biggest importer of Chinese goods. That helps China. So despite the numerous challenges that lie ahead, the U.S. and consequently the dollar are uniquely poised to outperform during the upcoming calendar year. Now, we want to be careful that we don't repeat what we saw in 2015. And that was, again, we moved into the first quarter of the dollar was doing very well. And we moved into the first quarter of 2016. And the economy stalled. And the dollar went all the way down to 92.89 from approximately 100. So we've got to be very, very careful. We want to watch very closely that the dollar doesn't just peter out in this first quarter. Now, granted, much of the pessimism was warranted given weak inflation and, volatile, and the volatile presidential race and tapering growth during the first half of this past year. However, given the outlook and recent policy adjustments, 2017 is shaping up to be a significantly different than 2016 for the U.S. dollar. Now, even though we have a big divergence in monetary policy, a lot of this is going to be offset by this huge stimulus, infrastructure spending, jobs creation that Donald Trump is promising us. Okay. And so his first 90 days in office is going to give us a quick signal 
as to what he will be able to accomplish if any of this, or he's just all talk. Because a man can talk everything during his, you know, his election period, but it's once you've taken office, what can you actually accomplish? And can you get the things you're promising actually done? And the first, it's actually in the U.S. is considered the first 100 days in office. And they are looked at very, very close because he doesn't get most of his stuff in order. We're just going to fizzle out and just assume his presidency is going to be a, a wash. And so a lot of people are sitting on the sidelines because what he says and what he can deliver might change very much after January 20th. Now, the Fed's not only raised rates, but also made an unprecedented upgrade to its interest rate path for 2017. Now, we want to watch for three factors. We're going to carefully, carefully monitor the U.S. dollar based on two things. Every speech and every speaker from the Feds, as long as they remain hawkish, will be all right. But last year, we saw them flip to become very dovish. Once they become dovish, that starts taking the rates off the table. And as each month goes by, there's less time to raise the rates. So like this past year, we were expecting at least two rate increases. By September, we knew we weren't going to get anything until December. And we had one. Now, the other thing is only part of Trump's grand plans will come into fruition. Politicians' promises should be taken with a grain of salt. And sometimes the markets... And some thing, the markets have not applied so far. You know, the stock market is soaring in the U.S., all based on promises from Trump. They haven't been cautious, and I don't know why. So we want to be very, very careful and optimistic. And I keep repeating this because we have a great big unknown. And when you have an unknown, we don't know what's going to happen. Because it's not that we have a new president coming in. We have a new president that is a little bit off kilter, but he has no political history. He has no doctrine. He's got no experience in dealing with politics. And dealing with the political animal is a lot different than dealing with the business animal. And he could come into office and alienate everybody and never get anything through Congress. You know, it's not like you're a Boston corporation. You sign a piece of paper, say, do this doesn't happen that way. He's got very limited powers into what he can do. So let's take a look at the overall global Forex market and what's happening around the world because we, we have all of this stuff going on uh, in the political situation because with the upset of, of well, we saw it originally in Greece. And we saw an anti-euro uh, supporter take, take into power. We then saw the Italian government fall apart. We saw Brexit. Okay. And this is leaving a big opening. We have big, important French elections. And we have other countries that keep that are under pressure to follow this Brexit. Okay. We also don't know what is going to really happen in the UK because they don't seem to be able to, to actually get this Article 50 done. And when Theresa May said she was going to say, sign it and send it in March, every all of a sudden, all this big support for Brexit kind of died away. And now they're saying that he has to get put it through Parliament and get it approved. The courts say it's got to be done this. You have Scotland you know, voicing their upset. You have Ireland voicing their upset. And nobody knows exactly what's going to happen here. Now, looking outside the U.S. for a second, risk of economies considered part of the major currency crosses are considerably to the downside, at least over the medium term. From every central bank across Europe and Asia has signaled that it intends to hold firm or continuing printing money, and in some cases, easing even further. Now, there's not much further that you can go easing except farther than negative rates, but they can keep buying. and um, you know, this is artificially helping, but inflation isn't getting 
isn't happening. And that, that's a big problem when the banks, the central banks are buying up all these assets, getting their balance sheets bigger and bigger, and they're getting no inflation, no jobs growth, no wage growth, and no increase in GDP. Um, the European Central Bank has extended its asset purchases while the Bank of England enlarged its quantitative easing by 60, million, 60 billion pounds right after Brexit. Japan intends to keep targeting yields on bonds while the Swiss National Bank attempts to escape from persistent deflation. Now, the Bank of Japan is quite happy because they were upset when they could not get the yen to weaken. Finally, the U.S. dollar has taken off and pushed the yen back up because they need to have the yen very, very weak to make their export very, very competitive. But it wasn't successful. Even the year that it traded at 120 to 125 wasn't very successful for them. Now it fell down and was staying at 108, which was upsetting everything. It's climbed back up steadily since the dollar has climbed up. But nothing is really seems to be helping the Japanese economic situation. Now, New Zealand and Australia are also fighting stubbornly low inflation. Now, both the New Zealand and the Australian economy are in fairly good shape. They just need a little bit of a push to move it forward. And as China starts to rebound, this should pull them right along. Now, the Kiwi and the Australian dollar are trading way below their average levels for last year, but that's only because of the strength of the dollar. So the Aussie against the, dollar, the, Aussie against the New Zealand dollar are trading still at the same level they were. As a result of more expansionary and accommodated policies prevailed across much of the developed world, while the Federal Reserve is the sole institution tightening policy amongst the majors and is, and is paving a clear path for the dollar, but not only to book gains, but to continue climbing. This means that you should or possibly can consider in long term buying up the Australian dollar and New Zealand dollar every time it dips down. Because sooner or later, the U.S. dollar is going to ease. Sooner or later, it's going to, you know, numbers aren't going to come in as strong. And we see the dollar go down to 98, 99. And the Australian dollar and New Zealand dollar should rebound. Now, on the euro side, the European Central Bank's decision in December to alter its QE program proved significant. It was much more than the markets expected. And the ECB will likely be forced to remove the zero, the minus 0 0.40 barrier and remove the key restrictions. They're, so we're going to expect some more easing in the forms of changing monetary policy. They don't have any rate movement to go. And they're running out of bonds to buy. So they're going to have to keep altering their position or their rules of what they can buy. And they're going to start buying up less and less valuable assets. By going the former route as opposed to the latter, the ECB has primed the euro to be in a disadvantaged position if interest rates elsewhere continue to climb. So we can expect the euro to stay down at 102, 103, because even if the dollar weakens, there's a very small chance that something's going to help the euro climb. So overall, we looked at, at five different scenarios to come up with our values. We looked at the cylindrical look, the outlook. We looked at monetary policy and reflation. We looked at currency vol volatility and the Trump factor. In addition, we have a wild card factor, which is our tail risk scenario. In our wild card scenario, we consider political instability in Europe. In our view, a sharp increase in political uncertainty in Europe would be a euro negative and create demand for traditional safe havens such as the Swiss franc, the Japanese yen, and the, the currency out of Denmark. Now, some odd predictions have come out, and I filtered them down. Saxo came out with some off-the-wall productions just to give everybody a chuckle, and they weren't serious about them. But if this happens, they're going to say, look, we told you. But they're expecting, they're, they're saying we could see Chinese GDP swell to 8%. Okay? But they said it with a chuckle. We also say also that the desperate Fed will follow BOG, BOJ's lead to fix assets at uh, treasuries at 1.5. They also say maybe Britex will never happen. We get UK remains. But these were, these were comical 
So remember that. They said Italian banks turn out to be the best performing equity assets. They could be because at the bottom of the barrel, maybe they'll, they'll reestablish themselves. And the EU stimulates growth through mutual euro bonds. Won't happen. But let's take a look at some serious stuff. Our current assessment is that Trump's administration tax and infrastructure plans will have a mildly positive impact on the U.S. economy towards the second half of 2017 and 2018. We currently make no assumptions with the respect to trade policy changes other than modestly marking down our forecast through the first half of 2017. Given a potentially serious negative consequence of Mr. Trump's possible trade policies, we expect that firms will remain cautious until there's greater clarity on his plans. So we might see some effect on some multinational companies. Okay. But changing trade agreements or breaking trade policies isn't something that can be done easily or lightly. Okay. And most people don't think any of this will change. But we don't know. Our overall assessment of growth is highly preliminary and will be adjusted. And, and remember, even though Mr. Trump is taking credit for the better than expected economy, he's done nothing. He's not even in office. Okay, he has done absolutely nothing. And he has, no, you know, the economy lags way behind politics. And whatever a president does while in office, it takes months and months to filter down and really affect the economy. I mean, the feds are the only ones that have direct immediate effect. Okay. And so Trump taking a claim for what's happening right now is way off balance. But in the U.S., tax cuts and infrastructure spending will provide a modest boost to growth when implemented. So if he can get some of these tax cuts through and start some of these infrastructure projects he's talking about, even building his wall, okay, it's going to mean more government spending, more government spending. It's just like the central bank printing money. Okay. But again, we have where do we get the money from? So compared with our previous forecast, we have trimmed U.S. growth in 2017 to 0 0.1 percentage point by 1 percentage to 2.1, owing to initial caution in private investment decisions. U.S. growth is expected to remain otherwise broadly supported by mildly improving consu consumer spending. The USD should, will, should strengthen in 2017 if we see anything on the negative, it's probably going to be rolling into 2018. Now, we have adjusted our CAD profile because the Canadian dollar is very dependent on the U.S. economy. But with Trump being such an isolationist, it might not flow over. And the Canadian dollar is very much uh, in tune with gold and oil prices because that is two of their biggest exports. So... The U.S. dollar will remain way, well supported against the main European currencies. We expect Brexit to be an ongoing challenge to the pound, especially with respect to the activation of Article 50 next year. We have adjusted our EU forecast slightly lower into 2017 to reflect the likelihood of additional ECB moving, easing measures and political event risk in the Eurozone during the coming, month, coming months. Now, core consumer inflation or core consumer uh, expenditure inflation in the U.S. is expected to reach 1.9% by the end of next year. Okay, The feds would like it to see it at 2. So as long as it's not coming up quickly, because the feds don't want to overshoot that too. If we see it coming there too, they're going to start raising rates more quickly. Okay, the history of populism is one of physical largest. U.S. rates have backed up quickly after the election, driven largely by a repricing of inflation expectations. With long-term inflation break-evens closing on their historical averages, we think the next phase of rate moves will be led by the belly of the curve and real interest rates. The market expectations for Fed hikes in coming years has sufficient room to increase relative to the projected the current projections in our view. While the U.S. fixed income sell-off is likely to continue spilling over into other bond markets, yield differentials are still likely to move in favor of the U.S. dollar. 
Okay. The USD JPY, the Japanese yen, will likely be the main foreign exchange beneficiary of U.S. fiscal expansion given its high sensitivity to rates and the Bank of Japan's 10-year yield target. We continue. We see continued uh, Chinese yuan depreciation against the dollar, adding pressure on China to weaken its currency to loosen financial conditions, while increased trade tensions could further pressure the, the currency. Now, nominal growth in the U.S. could rise to 3 to 4 percent with a real GDP around 2 percent. Remember, last quarter, our U.S. GDP far excelled the forecasts. So here's what we're taking a look at. We're expecting, and we're just going to look at the majors, we're expecting, in moving into 2017, that the Canadian dollar against the dollar will remain at 138. We expect that the first quarter, the second quarter to climb to 140, only because that's where we're going to feel the strength of the dollar. If we get a rate increase, if the Fed start talking positive in the March meeting, or the end of Donald Trump's 100 days. We're going to expect it then in the third quarter to fall back to 138 and even fall lower to fourth quarter to 136 as the U.S. dollar eases off. The euro, we're expecting it to drop to 102 in the first quarter of this year, stay down at 102, maybe regain a third quarter as the dollar loses some momentum, and end the year about 110, a little bit better than where it was now, than where it is now, and lower than it was in third quarter 2016. The yen is, we expect to stay even across the board over the first half at one, around 110. We'll see it ease down against the dollar a little bit, to 115 and 115 as the Bank of Japan keeps moving, easing in. We expect the Australian dollar to remain at, at 076, 076. The, the, the RBA would like the Australian dollar at 075, and we expect it to reach 075 by third quarter and stay there across fourth quarter. So this is where we are. We would, we would like to see the Japanese yen at 690, we see it climbing to, to seven dollars seven against the U.S. dollar, and then going back to 695, but getting stronger in quarter four. The Japanese yen is always strongest towards the end of the year. Okay, now gold. Gold's another tough question. You know, um, gold is a hedge against inflation. So. We buy gold to fight high inflation. We buy gold in political risk situations. And we buy gold when the dollar is very weak. Okay. We don't have any of those three scenarios. Now, don't, just don't misunderstand me. We're not going to see gold. You know, we're going to see gold dipping up and down, up and down, up and down. But gold is going to kind of get stuck where it is. So gold was hot in the first six months of last year. But hardly anyone predicted the monster rally we saw in 2016, as it always goes right at a time that everybody got overly excited. Gold prices stalled and have gone nowhere since then. Consequently, around summertime, when the consensus around a bullish gold forecast for 2017, remember, Federal Reserve, higher rates, lower gold, because gold's a non-interest bearing item. Okay, That's why we saw gold down falling down, the dollar going up. It basically, you know, runs against each other except where we have safe havens in there. But we're expecting gold to come down to, 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 to trade around the support level at 990, uh, maybe as low as 890 in the second half of, eight, of 2017 when the, the dollar is at its strongest point. Or if we get a Federal Reserve rate increase in March, April, or May. Now, basically, the reaction of the market to the Fed's decision is only accelerating gold sell-off, confirming our gold forecast. The chart actually the gold, uh, go over here in gold shows you where gold fell. Gold's currently trading at, at a low number. But we, we expect, overall, the 1,000 to be the important level for gold this week, this year. Okay. I, I would sell gold every time it dips up. Every time it peaks, 
sell it going down, but to sell it to hold on to it. You're not going to get a dip right away, but you're going to see gold continue to fall down. So every time you can buy on a peak, buy it up and put it away for later in the year. Now, heading into 2017, gold markets have been roiled by Trump's presidency-led Trump's presidency-led optimism. As investors riding higher on expectations that the potential reforms and policies to be implemented by Trump would yield positive results, spurring U.S. economic growth and higher inflation expectations. So we want to, again, we're going to get a firmer stand on this after Mr. Trump's first 100 days. Okay. If he's actually able to institute any of these policies he's talking about, we might see gold fall. We're going to have to watch very carefully where the economic data is in February, March, and April to see where the, what the feds might do also. So further, markets are largely ignoring the negatives. If Trumponomics disappoints the expectations, which would spark a fresh spell of uncertainty across financial markets, the lift and lift the demand for gold as an, an ultimate safe haven. So be very, very careful. Watch what, don't listen to what Trump is saying. Don't listen to his tweets, his headlines. Watch the financial data and watch what, what laws, what rules, what policies are actually being taken forward. Okay. Now, higher inflation expectations for the U.S. and China. According to many analysts, inflationary policy across China and the U.S. are likely to boost speculative flows into electronically traded funds related to gold. Likewise, the ongoing fiscal stimulus and peaking housing markets prices in China have significantly boosted money supply growth in the economies, with the Chinese investor now turning to riskier assets such as equities and commodities in order to take yield advantages, which would help prop up prices and increase Chinese demand. Markets tend to store a portion of their wealth in gold in order to hedge against inflationary pressures. Now, according to the World Gold Council, China's gold demand has dropped this year with third quarter consumption demands way down. We're expecting it to pick back up in this coming year. In the meantime, India's gold demands also would also stabilize after a considerable decline witnessed in the aftermath of the government's demonetization scheme implemented last month. China and India are the world's largest gold consuming nations, but they consume and hold on to gold. They're not gold traders. They're gold investors and owners. Now, what you want to watch is any headlines about the Eurozone. That will push gold prices up. Expect 1,200 to be the absolute tops. Okay, If it's going to peak up 1,263, 1,163 will be a support and resistance point. Eurozone remains exposed to risks of disintegration as a slew of elections and referendums remain in the cards especially after Britain's exit from the Eurozone in June and Italy's constitutional amendment referendum. Though nothing's happened, you just have all of this stuff hanging out there. The troubled Italian banks combined with significant increase in perceived Eurozone exit probabilities across many nations, particularly France and the Netherlands, could refuel safe haven demands for gold. So we're looking at gold coming down to this support line. here, here, this is where we're trading now, and if it bounces back up, we forget the 1500, forget the 12, the 13, but we're expecting 1163 to be the support level. In longer term aspects, we're expecting an eight, nine, a 990 and an 890 bounce. Okay, so you can take a look at those on your charts. But gold prices ran into falling channel resistance at near 1380, and from there has dropped drastically. The 1380 was a big hit over a year ago, but we can watch them closely. The other thing we want to watch this year is oil. Oil was crazy last year, drove everybody nuts. And for the first time in eight years, OPEC agreed to cut crude oil production, marking a turning point in the price war at the center of the cartel politics. As a result, our 2017 forecasts are unchanged leaving WTI crude oil at $59 a barrel and Brent at an average of 61. That's the, the top averages. 
we can really feel pretty safe at $55. Pricing forecast embedded ebbed a, a sequential 500,000 barrel per day increase in U.S. crude productions. Because remember, U.S. crude has been dropping as the price had dropped because it just wasn't worth them producing. So we're going to have some offset because as OPEC cuts back, prices go up, U.S., especially shale producers, go back into full production. So we're expecting U.S. production raising an economic output up to 9.2 million barrels a day by the end of 2017. So yearly gains of nearly 45% for brood and almost 38% for WTI were impressive. But all of that came since September, and it's all been based not on use, not on supply and demand. It's only been based on headlines from OPEC. That is it. During the year, energy markets saw a continued decline in investments, which translates into falling production in the U.S. and elsewhere. Demand growth is solid and better than expected, led by India and the developing world. Looking ahead, for, looking ahead WTI oil prices are likely to move through the 50s in 2017 and end the year near 60. The market is concerned about oil shale production ramping up, but most producers will remain disciplined and investments likely will not increase until prices get above $55 and look stable. Predicting where oil would go next year or ne next month or next year has always been a game of hit and miss. All the more so in the past two years since the oil price crashed. Analysts have forecast everything from $10 to $70 at various points with the year. And actual prices have also had a bumpy ride with WTI crude ranging from $30 in January a year ago the 17-month high briefly touching over $55 on December the 12th. But why did it hit $55? That's when we got final word of OPEC. So heading in 2017, the oil price predictions by major organization investments are generally not widely diverging and hovering between $50 and $60, but there seems to be some wilder points of view. As always, the game of predicting oil prices will have some winners and losers next year, too. Okay. The big question is, will, would OPEC stick to his promise cut? And what's happened is, even though they promised cuts, all the smaller nations seem to ignore it, and they turn up their cut. You have Iraq and Iran. You have Libya as a wild card out there. Let's say, so what those cuts rebalance the market at some point next year. Even if they were to start the year with striking to, sticking to cuts, would some OPEC and non-OPEC producers start cheating and renege on pledges once they see more revenues at higher oil prices? Okay, what everybody keeps missing is we have so much oil inventory. We have cargo ships floating in the ocean, packed full. The storage rates for oil cars are, is going through the ceiling. We have silos. We have inventory stacked everywhere. It's going to take a long time for OPEC to cut back production to use up all that glut that is floating around everywhere. So how fast U.S. shale prices will, will rebound? That's going to be pretty fast. You know, U.S. isn't dependent on governments, U.S. producers, and they're all hedging. They all want to turn those taps back on to start seeing some profit. How would this affect global supply and demand prices? How would OPEC react to U.S. shale resurgence? So Goldman Sachs raised... Friday raised its oil forecast for 2017 after reassessing the likelihood that key global oil markets led by Saudi Arabia will stick to their output cuts pledges under OPEC's efforts. So what Goldman Sachs sees is for quarter one coming in, we start now, WTI at $55, Brent to $56.5. So we're also looking at a spread of about $1.50. Going into quarter two, oil prices moving up to 57.5 and Brent at $59 with a spread there at $1.50 again. Third quarter, we're looking at $55, U.S. oil falling back down and Brent climbing back up because we have a lot of seasonality factored in there with the spread moving to $2. But we can see that $55 is the key level for WTI, this U.S. crude oil, and 56 to 57 is the overall average for Brent for the next year. 
So again, you can look at those to buy them on dips and sell them on peaks. So they'll give you some reassurance. But there you have it. This is Our guess is as good as yours. I mean, we sat and put some more numbers to papers, looked at the numbers. But you know what? It's hard to, to predict. So watch each of the major banks and brokers change their minds over the year again and again and throughout the year. But be very careful. Be aware. And have a great 2017. Thank you very much for joining us tonight. And we'll talk to you again real soon. Bye now.